stood there for 20 years until his death, uh, 1875 to 1895. Now, I, I did have some introductory things, though, and I did bring some show and tell for you briefly. These are all historical stuff. Uh, I do a lot of that kind of work, too. These are technical stuff over here related to Coke, and so we, we'll have a little show and tell maybe along the way. Uh, uh, I, I started in chemical engineering here. Uh, the very first year engineering was announced at BYU in 18, in 19, which is like, <laughs> in 1952. There were no faculty members in chemi. Didn't get the first one until 1955, Billings Brown. And uh, I watched that department grow and was a part of it. I maintain even now that I know more about the history of engineering and chemical engineering, particularly at BYU, than any other person. Uh, I'm the only one that's around that went through all of that. I did write a book. Uh, you may not have seen it, or, uh, but you see the picture in the hallway. I did that. Those 30 faculty members, the first 50 years, I wrote that book uh, uh, then, in 1952 to 2002, on the history of uh, chemical engineering. And so I, I have a lot. And I'm impressed with what's happened in Kemi. Uh, remember, I, I got up when I first came here, there were three faculty members. Uh, they were, uh, Bill Pope was the fourth, and he was working in Iran. You could do that then. And, uh, uh, but uh, Jim Christensen and Dee Barker were the other two. And I, I got hired in the fall of 1960 and uh, came to BYU as a new uh, assistant professor. I was assigned, hold your breath, three new first preparation courses my first semester. And three courses to teach. And I was so busy, we were in the Fletcher building. We had a half-time secretary. That's all we had. Okay, and I got a call from President Wilkinson's office, his secretary, you remember Ernest L. Wilkinson, you know that name? Tough guy, you know, attorney, et cetera. His secretary said, Brother Smoot, couldn't you come over and see the president wants to talk to you? Uh, you know, put a little pressure on me, I guess, to be a good professor. Anyway, uh, I said yes, tomorrow at such an hour. Well, you know with three classes, you don't have any time. I taught everything I knew in that class, and then I had to start over the next day, you know. And I worked right through that appointment. And she called me after that. Oh, I was embarrassed. She said, Brother Smoot, oh, I told her. She said, well, could you come tomorrow at that? I said, yes. I worked through that again. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's how busy I was. And she said, do you suppose you could remember long enough to come now? <laughs> and I did, and he never brought it up. Anyway, I'd tell you that because those are some early history things that, that, and what it was like for me when I was an assistant professor here. Uh, of course, <coughs> since then, uh, I was here, watched the growth of the program uh, when the master's degree program started, when accreditation occurred, when we got a PhD program. I advised a lot of students. It seemed like there was some in there even, like 50 or 60 students I had as graduate students. So uh, things were changing along the way anyway. Now. The second, uh, I, uh, that, that's just a brief introduction to tell you how important chemical engineering is to me and how impressive it is as to what's happened. Already up to the prospect of 17 professors, uh, faculty members, and uh, wow, what a change from zero. And then one, <laughs> and then, yeah. Anyway, I saw it all. Uh, now I want to talk briefly about, uh, uh, on my presentation, uh, uh, about clean coke. This, I'll spend more time on this. Uh, a little background there. I think I have the background on the chart, so, so we'll see. Uh, okay, what is coke? Uh, <coughs> uh, clean coke is, of course, the name we give uh, to a patent that we have, uh, uh, and you might expect that it's the production of coke with more environmentally favorable, favorable conditions. Uh, well, there are two major kinds of coke. I don't have a pointer. Uh, anybody have a pointer? Yeah, uh, one on I, can I point on here? No, just pick my finger up. Top button, okay. Okay. Top uh, arrow. Okay. Uh, metallurgical, metallurgical coke, which is the overwhelming amount of coke use uh, in, the United, in, in the world, okay. And then industrial coke. All right, and 
this is the main fuel for blast furnaces for iron making, uh, reduction of iron ore, okay? Uh, there's no clear future substitute for this. There's 350 million tons produced annually, and a typical price might be, it varies, <coughs> well, that's the reason up and down depending on the economy and everything, 200 to 350 dollars a ton. I've seen it over 400 dollars a ton. There's another kind of coke, this is industrial coke, uh, uh, and uh, we make both these kinds of coke in our process. Uh, foundry, coke, metal reduction, other than steel, for example, phosphorus or silica or issues that, so we tend to work on both those. Uh, sugar refining, uh, these are have less demanding specifications on there. This is about 80 million tons a year. Typical prices are shown there. This is a piece of coke. Uh, it doesn't show a scale on there. They could be quite large, but uh, 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 coming from a slot oven furnace, almost <coughs> all the coke in the United States is made in a large batch slot oven furnace process. Geneva Steel had one great big slot oven furnace out there. Uh, it's a batch process and you heat a great, you, you have a big open door, you load it from the top and fill it with uh, metallurgical coal. You only make this from metallurgical coal. Okay, we make clean coke without metallurgy or coal, which is nice. Okay, heat it over 24 hours to very high temperature, about 1,000 degrees, and then you push it out uh, one side of that great big oven and fill it again. And that takes about 24 hours, it's a batch process, and very, very environmentally uh, 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 awkward, uh, difficult, terrible. Okay, uh, 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 industrial coke, it's still used very extensively. <coughs> this is a piece that, that comes from a slot oven. I, I have to move on here for sure. Let's see, I don't want to get too many buttons out of the way. Uh, this, is what, this is what happened with clean coke. Early on when combustion resources was first formed, I won't have time to tell that history, uh, uh, we did initial consulting work with uh, Geneva Steel. They had a blast furnace. They have a lot of waste product, you saw <coughs> in the previous chart. Besides pushing out and getting some chunks of metal through coal, you get really fine stuff uh, called coke base, and less fine stuff called nut coke, and you can't use it all, and so we were working to see if we could find ways to use that. Uh, we obtained uh, Department of Energy funding. Uh, we also obtained a center of excellence. We received a patent uh, uh, not so long ago, and uh, then formed a formal relationship particularly to help us with commercialization with uh, Utah State. Uh, I'll tell you why, why not BYU, but uh, there's a good reason. But uh, uh, it relates to Utah State's owning now and being the College of Eastern Utah. It came from that source. Okay, now we'll go back to my slides here. Got a lot of buttons. Okay, this is a picture of uh, uh, of clean coal. Does this advance the slides too? Yeah, Which one? The center button or what? The right, the right, right arrow. Oh, the right one does. Okay, that I can now go back down to there. These are photographs of our clean coal. There's some pieces up here. Uh, uh, this is a small coke briquette. You can look. Here's some you can see in a sack. Looks about like that. You get the idea of the scale size this way, though, more accurately. We make it bigger. Here's a bigger piece. This is more like for foundry coke use, stuff like that. Uh, on. Uh, well, advantage. This is probably the most important chart uh, on the whole page. This is a continuous, more rapid process, like uh, four hours compared to 24 hours. And that has cost implications. It also has much less. Uh, at, oh, oh, excuse me, Mac. Uh, it is a, a, a design product. We designed and tailored this product for its individual use, uh, for the properties you have to have. Size and quality can be uniform in size. Uh, uh, the use of discarded feedstocks are commonly used. For example, we use a lot of petroleum coke. It's a good feedstock. Often, very small particles that people wouldn't use, waste particles, we, can make, we, we have to grind them anyway if we don't, if they're not small. Shipping costs are favorable because you can locate this near the stable coal supplies. Utah's a very good supplier. Uh, utilization uh, or sale of byproducts. 
uh, you have to clean the off gas that comes from cooking this to, to, uh, the product. And of course, it produces some valuable products, as you'll see. Has very low emission levels, relatively. Uh, uh, we uh, have no waste materials, and we have lower energy requirements, and we can tailor and meet industrial specifications. So there's some advantages. Now, I, I won't spend long on this, but <coughs> this gives you an idea of what metallurgical coke property requirements are. Now, they're not uniform throughout the world, uh, but they're quite similar to this, uh, and this is a worldwide, uh, uh, China makes most of the metallurgical coke right now. Uh, let's see the, the uh, was on the top, yeah, okay. Two of the important indexes are reactivity and strength. Most of this is consumed in large blast furnaces. And there, it has to be strong enough to support the weight of the bed above it. It also has to react fast enough. See, the coke is actually providing the energy by heat of combustion, by uh, reacting uh, the carbon coke uh, with, the, with the oxygen, the air, okay? And uh, it also has to uh, be very strong to support that bed. But there are also all kinds of other requirements. Here are industrial specs that are typical. These are ranges of some clean coke properties that we have uh, produced. And uh, so, uh, not, but we can tailor this product to, to their needs uh, in, in general. Okay. Let's see, it's, uh, I thought it was that one. Yeah, it was. Uh, we built a pilot plant. This pilot plant is located near Helper, Utah. It's on the site that belongs to USU. When we got started, it belonged to the College of Eastern Utah. Now you can see a reason for <coughs> the association there. Uh, it, it has a capacity of three or four tons per day. Right now, we're proposing to increase that to 10 to 12 tons per day because you have an industrial company that wants a large supply to test. Uh, th this is a photograph of that. I won't talk about This is the probably most important part. It's the it's the coking furnace, but we'll, we'll, I'll show you a schematic of this along the way. Uh, this plant, of course, helps us demonstrate the mixing process, the blending of the various ingredients, the briquetting, the coking, and the tar separation, so we can say, yeah, it does work, and people that come are interested can see it actually function. We've tested a wide variation in formulation, briquette size, process, and requirements. Uh, the, uh, we have an opportunity now, uh, that's the best one we've had as we've moved along in this development, for a commercial uh, plant. Now, don't interpret that to say that I, Dr. Smith, that they're building a new commercial plant for this. It isn't that far along. It is a good opportunity, and I'll describe it to you and what's happening there, uh, uh, but uh, I don't know uh, for sure whether this takes place or not. It's the closest we've been, though. Uh, uh, we have a large coal company with an expanding coal connection, Bauer Coal Company. They're an international company. You can look them online. And they uh, are working with us uh, on this uh, commercialization process. We also have a large national chemical company. You would know the name, but I can't disclose that name yet. It's still held as uh, proprietary. Uh, and we have significant interest uh, uh, from this chemical company in recent initial tests. We tested made 150 tons of clean coke. This is, a, this is an industrial application. It's only a half inch in size. It's quite small. And uh, it tested very, very well. And they seem quite excited about it. Now, the short time results for, uh, met their specifications. Now they're requesting, that's why we want to expand, 1,500 tons so that they can test uh, for a longer period of time. <coughs> it'll take, that'll be 30% of their coke load and it will take that full uh, 1,500 ton. If this were to work, and I'm quite confident that it will work successfully in the system, and they placed an order for all of their coke, uh, it would be sufficient to support uh, the first chemical plant. So that's what's interesting to us. Okay. 
so uh, let's talk about that plant. Uh, it has five components. Uh, I'm, uh, it would be planned at uh, 62,500 tons per year with base capacity, and we estimate the product cost would be 200 and uh, sell for $275. Uh, this is the schematic diet. This is a simple plant. The stuff is all off the shelf. That's a nice thing. You, uh, you, there's nothing that has to be done otherwise. Uh, you you have a variety of feedstocks, and they're uh, they're uh, crushed if they need to be blended uh, and mixed, and eventually then briquetted at high pressure. <coughs> you build the briquette pockets to the size of the briquette you want, and then uh, that controls the size. Uh, we also circulate tars that we get uh, uh, from the process uh, which we blend. Uh, we add uh, tar material uh, uh, to glue this thing together. Uh, then we, the calciner or coker uh, is the uh, furnace. And this is continuous. And these briquettes go in, the, uh, <coughs> in this furnace and travel along. The one that we've designed for this plant is, uh, is about 400 feet long and operates at 1,000 degrees centigrade for the resident time about four hours. And uh, it drives off a substantial weight. Of, uh, this this uh, briquette has to go through major phase change, through a plastic phase, devolalize, uh, a lot of volatiles, harden until it's very hard. It has to be a very hard substance. We can do that in that system. Then, of course, we condense the gas and the solids. We circulate the tars, and then we clean up the gas, and uh, uh, you, uh, coming off that are additional tars, sulfuric acid, ammonium nitrate, BTX, products that can be marketed, okay? And uh, you can, you, uh, the nice thing about this continuous process is you get, uh, uh, you get, you can control the, the emissions, uh, you know, really well in the continuous process. Doug? Yeah. So I see from gas cleaning, you feed gases back into your calciner. Is that just off gas, or do you put any? No, yeah. Gas no, in it's there? Uh, it's the it's the uh, yeah it's the gas that hasn't been fully cleaned, recycled uh, the end clean part. Okay. So so you never add any. I, I know you're not going to add oxygen in there, but do you add any other gases <coughs> in your your system? No. Okay. Just recycle it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, here's the status. The, the, uh, I'm doing okay for time. The, uh, the, the process flow sheets with material and energy balances, we did this work at CR. Now, if this plant were to go ahead, this all conceptual and preliminary, then there would be a selection of a major uh, chemo, uh, or manif uh, company that builds plants, and they would design the plants and, uh, and, uh, and then build the plant and uh, pr provide turnkey operation. <coughs> uh, but uh, so far, to get an idea of cost and, and design and all, this would be feed information for them. They'd make use of this in their work. Whoops. Uh, we, we uh, model the plant with Pro2 and Aspen plant design programs. Uh, we uh, got specific vendor design quotes on components of equipment and selected those. Uh, we did the preliminary P and ID uh, uh, information and a uh, major industrial customer would, if this, that customer I talked about, if this plant went forward, the major, our major industrial customer would take 80% of the production. At, at, uh, now, we're thinking of expanding the plant to bigger We'd like to see that, but uh, you know, I showed you 62,500, but we, we hope that there might be a cent for 25,000. Uh, uh, Let's see, 200 and, what knows, 150,000. Yeah, that's the number I want. Okay. Uh, uh, for this specific company, we have built, we've made the coat for them. At the, already in the size in the pilot plant, and it meets the specs. We have four qualified coals, two from uh, uh, two uh, from Utah American Energy, <coughs> two from Bowie. Bowie is the company 
who is working with us. They want very much to provide their coal uh, to this, as you might guess. That no decision has been made on that yet. I can say, however, this is an encouraging thing. Uh, they made a contribution of three hundred thousand dollars to the expansion of the pilot plant to a larger capacity uh, as an indication of their interest in this process. Now that's a lot different than the cost of the plant. Uh, the, uh, as I said before, the big issue is that coking furnace. Uh, continuous operation, it's indirect fired uh, with uh, bur uh, burners that radiatively transfer the heat initially, but eventually convection and conduction become very important in this system. Uh, we spent a lot of time designing uh, and thinking about this uh, furnace, and it, it is the most important step. Uh, we have to have time temperature control. It's not uniform in there at all. It varies all the way along. There's a cooling section. Uh, time, it has to be a certain time at a certain temperature to go through these phase changes. We contacted several vendors <coughs> and finally settled on Seco Warwick uh, right now as tentative as the company we will use. They gave us a uh, design and equipment installation cost quote. Uh, seven million dollars, uh, I think, for the furnace of the smaller size. Uh, we've had extensive interaction with them, and they are responding to CR specification. Uh, uh, more on the coking furnace, uh, it is, of course, gas-fired. We, uh, not only is the tar produced uh, for, for putting into the briquettes, but all the combustion gas that is used in this furnace comes off the devolization products uh, that are uh, then uh, cleaned and sent in the cleaning plant and then sent back and fired so we have no requirement. In fact, we have excess heat and generate some electricity. Uh, oh, the, the way the system works is this uh, is a continuous, uh, oops, wrong one. It's a continuous uh, system, as I said before, and uh, the bed depth in this design is one foot thick. There are bins that go in one foot high, three feet wide, and seven feet long, and contain over a ton of uh, briquettes. And uh, these are small briquettes, half inch, and so we have to, in that, <coughs> uh, in every bin that goes through there, we have to heat those up at a controlled rate to get just the right uh, change of physical chemical changes to take place. The, the whole plant residence time is about four to six hours. That is more than just the heating and cooling part. First is 20 to 25 hours in the batch slot on furnace. The return down ratio on this, you can have a lot slower rates if you want, down to 10 to 1. Uh, Okay, now gas cleanup, tars and oils are condensed, nitrogen and sulfur are removed. Uh, we have a design on this plant. Uh, in fact, one of the former graduates from BYU, who then taught here for a short time, his name's Kent Hatfield, some will know him. Kent did the original design on a plant like this for Geneva Steel. And then he did the design for us on this plant here too. Uh, I already said the <coughs> gas is used to heat the coking furnace and generate power. And then equipment ins installation uh, cost, uh, we determined uh, for this cleanup process uh, from the Pro 2 design. Uh, this is more Kent's work. Uh, now, uh, the projected emissions for the 62,500 uh, air pollutants uh, uh, with uh, SCR about 4.5 tons per day, uh, tons per year of uh, the key pollutants are oxides of nitrogen, oxides of sulfur, and uh, uh, um, they qualify in the, in the minor source emitter level. Uh, that's a state statement. Uh, they, it's not so serious, uh, so they're favorable. Wastewater uh, we get about 94 tons per year, 
of those species, but after it's treated, it only ends up to be about 0.04 grams per ton of coke. So that looks pretty good to us. Uh, I thought you'd be interested in this. I just checked this in the last day or so uh, to see. Uh, would the environmentalists, uh, the extreme environmentalists, I'll say, I'll use that word, uh, be after this process because when you use the coke, in a blast furnace or other furnace, you produce carbon dioxide. And some people uh, indicate that carbon dioxide uh, is, <coughs> needs to be greatly reduced. I mean, the EPA now has made this regulation of a 32% reduction by 2030 uh, in the current amount. And uh, it turns out that uh, the current worldwide coke production right now uh, is about 0.35 billion tons per year. If I had an industrial coke, that would go up a bit. Uh, worldwide CO2 production from 100% coke conversion to CO2, okay, is 0.35 billion tons a year times 44 for CO2 over 12 for carbon, or about 1.3 billion tons a year. Now, you compare uh, the number for uh, the coke itself uh, up here with this number <coughs> is about 3 percent. Uh, total, total CO2 emissions of all the CO2 emitted, which would be coming from the coke, which is being used to produce steel or other products. So it's not a great threat uh, uh, to the uh, industry right now, but who knows? I don't know what happens. Anymore. Uh, now we do uh, we do have excess gas left over, and uh, so as you can see, uh, this is uh, we got 20, 20 uh, uh, million BTUs per hour of excess fuel gas of composition that, and it will generate about 3.5 megawatts electric. You don't have to do that; you could do something else with it. But this design has. Uh, an electric system included in the cost uh, to produce the power needs of the plant itself. Uh, where's the prospective location? Well, we look most seriously right now at Carbon County. Uh, it's a rural area. That means there are less stringent environmental requirements compared to the Wasatch Front, for example. Uh, uh, they're seeking coal-based technologies. They're seeking almost anything there that you could have make into a job. Uh, uh, feedstocks are near, coal suppliers. Uh, the existing uh, uh, rail spurs are available, all utilities are available, and there is a keen supporting interest if this were to go forward. We've actually identified some plots that tend to look favorable for this purpose. Now please don't conclude because you see all this work that this plant has been authorized to be built. Or funded. That, look, if it's funded, it's authorized. <laughs> okay, now, what's the cost? Well, equipment, construction, contingencies, about 44 million. We designed that furnace. The big component of the furnace, I mean, of the plant is that furnace. And the design we showed you is for twice this capacity. And, uh, and the scale up is very, very favorable on this. If we were to double the capacity, we show this to interested industrial companies. Look, for only this much more, you could produce twice that much. Okay, and uh, it turns out that for 125 tons per year, uh, you only go from 44 to 57 million. So that's that's 30 percent or something. Very favorable scale up on that. Incidentally, the way you scale these is really additional trains. Okay? Just add more trains along the way. Uh, there's a limit on how big you can build those furnaces uh, right now in terms of capability. Well, here's a rough estimated schedule. Uh, we can't know this. We can, uh, these have to happen in sequence. If the first one doesn't happen, the others don't follow. But uh, an estimate of authorization from the two industrial companies, uh, uh, three to six months, uh, pilot plant, coke production and evaluation, and we're going to expand that plant 
to 15 uh, to three times the capacity and produce 1,500 tons. Uh, that would be uh, nine months, financing six months, engineering permitting six months, construction startup 18 months. It'd be rough, but uh, they all have to happen sequentially. They're they're in series, and if you fall in the first hurdle, you don't get to try the next one. Well, now I stopped. Uh, I won't take questions now because I'll finish this part, but and I have plenty of time to do this. I wanted to throw in just a little bit of the history part of what's happening, uh, partly because it raised the directly to BRU, and there's going to be a lot on campus in the next few days. So I thought you might find that of some interest. Uh, as I said, I'm uh, I'm the president of the O. Smith Family Organization, and I've served for 40 years. I don't know why. But guess what? My term ends in 10 days. <laughs> I got a new guy to do it. Okay. Anyway, it is his 200th birthday anniversary. He was born in Kentucky in uh, 1815. He was the first president of the Board of Trustees. Oops, sorry. Back and then there. Uh, of the Academy, 1875 to 95. It'd be honored to be in Founders Week, which is that week right there, coming right up. We've been working at this for more than a year and a half. Uh, we said that already. Uh, be, we're working with BYU, our family, on the 200th birthday anniversary reunion. And you can read if you want. You can see all kinds of stuff on our blog site, uh, aosmood.blogspot.com. We have all kinds of information about the family and, and him and, and, and stuff like that. Okay, let's see what's next. Well, here's some reunion highlights. Uh, opening ceremony at Marriott Center. That's for you. Uh, you know, this, is, this takes the place of the devotional uh, a week from this coming Tuesday on the 6th of October. University luncheon with the president, uh, DLWC, that cost 20 bucks. You can register. Uh, you know they don't stop you from that, but but you have to pay. Uh, then the main reunion event after that is in the Wilkinson Center. That's when we gather the whole family and do all kinds of fun stuff, uh, selling important products and issues of that sort. Uh, the uh, BY, and then on Wednesday, that, uh, the, this is all Tuesday. On Wednesday we have a presentation at the Academy Building both on the Academy uh, a Square building, namely the Provo City Library Academy Square, and the Tabernacle becoming the Provo City uh, uh, Center Temple. And uh, that's because A.O. Spook was responsible for building both of those buildings and paying for one of them. He built one as the stake president of the Utah Stake, all of Utah Valley. He built the other one as the first president of the Board of Trustees. To me, the two most important buildings in Provo and ironically, both now will have been preserved. That's kind of a miracle. We published a new book. I did I not bring that. Oh, it shows in the picture here. You'll see it. Uh, we wrote a new book just for this. Uh, we, we had previously published, uh, a cousin and I, this book on his life. <coughs> but the new book is, is smaller, but just for this reunion. It's called Abraham Owens Boot, His Life and Service in Provo. And, uh, we're pleased about that. Uh, oh, I should say also we have a new bronze stand statue to be unveiled on Wednesday, uh, a week from yesterday, two weeks from yesterday, uh, of Aosmood. Beautiful statue. That's and it will be at the Academy building uh, where he spent his service and time there. And of course there's a parade and all kinds of activities that go on. Now, uh, this is the presentation that I'm going to give, uh, and, and uh, it only lasts five minutes, that's all the time they gave me, at the, at the luncheon next uh, uh, week, to, week this coming Tuesday. And, and uh, it tells about him. Now, the well, they probably like to hear that much. So I'll pull that out right here. And then I even have some concluding comments. Okay, this I'm going to, uh, as I see, see these, I've got to advance this and I can do that. Uh, first couple, I, okay, so that's the first one. And uh, 
this is the uh, this is where the tech starts. So I'll see if I can coordinate this. Incidentally, when I give this talk a week from Tuesday over in the mer in the uh, ballroom, I'll have somebody doing this part for me. Anyway, it is a privilege to honor Abraham Oswood and his family Jungen in the year of his 200th birthday anniversary. President James E. Faust once told me, I served as near 70 and got really well acquainted. He's the one I went to uh, to get the church's financial support on the academy building. He, he, he was precious to me like a second father. Here's what he told me, Doug. One that repeatedly speaks of his ancestors is like a potato. The best part of them is underground. A. <laughs> <laughs> Osprey was born in Owen County, Kentucky in 1815. He joined the Mormon Church in 1835 and spent the balance of his life in service to the church, his family, and his communities. He was in Kirtland and Missouri and was in Nauvoo, uh, 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 showing the Nauvoo Temple, when he wrote in his journal on Christmas Day, you can imagine, that's what he wrote on Christmas Day, 1845, just before they were forced out to cross the plains. They were working day and night in that temple to do endowments and, and uh, ordinances before they uh, went west. Here's what he said, uh, Christmas Day, 1845, spent by me in the most agreeable of all Christmases I have ever spent pouring the holy anointing oil on the heads of the brother on that Christmas day. He crossed the plains in 1847 as a captain of 100 families uh, to Salt Lake Valley, where he served as mayor, bishop, husband, father, businessman, judge, territorial legislator, and missionary. In 1868, <laughs> tells me to advance that, when A.O. was 53 years old, Brigham Young called him to go to Provo. He and his large family, including four wives, uh, Margaret, Emily, Diana, and Annie, and those of his living of his 16 children, one or two of the deceased, were <coughs> in Provo, where A.O. built homes for each of his wives. Uh, eight more children were born between 1869 and 1885, while he was in Provo. Uh, the new book just published, so I, okay, that's the book I thought I brought a copy of. That's the new one, okay? Just out for this reunion, okay? Uh, Abraham Oswood, His Life and Service in Provo, provides a history of his remarkable record of unselfish service in this valley. It seems improbable that one person could have accomplished so much in every aspect of his life, including missionary service, hold your breath, in eight missions, uh, husband to four wives in Provo, and father of 24 blood children, including many uh, 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 other children. I don't want to miss the next. Oh, there it is. Uh, Bishop of Provo and president at the same time, president of the Utah State, which is all of Utah Valley and Heber Valley. Uh, uh, and let's see if I go there. That's his next picture when he was that, Utah State President. And was responsible in that role for building the Provo Tabernacle as the State President. Uh, now, of course, becoming the Provo City Center Temple. The line I like best about that is uh, they're not only resurrecting that tabernacle, they are exalting it. <laughs> The mayor of Provo from 1868 to 1882, still the longest standing mayor of Provo. We have three chapters in this book on his service as mayor. Still, uh, and he developed the Provo Woolen Mills, uh, as downtown Provo was. Uh, it was Provo's most prominent business uh, for many years. Uh, uh, regarding that woolen mill, too, like this. Brigham Young's telegraph wire in about 1871 to A.O. Smoot, which I have as an original document, regarding the wool mill said the following, quote, A.O. Smoot, raise sufficient money and send east for the equipment forthwith. And of course, they're talking about the wool mills. For ye of little faith, and if possible, 
less works. B Y, and then the old one reprimand, collect three dollars. <laughs> he, he did. He worked with Brigham and did so much for him. Under Brigham's assignment. Let's see. I have to go. Oh well. Let's see. Uh, I, that tabernacle comes up at the. Let's see. Did I talk about the tabernacle? Oh yeah, I did. So let's see. The next one up is at ten. Let's see what that one is. Oh yeah, that's the Woolen Mills. I didn't pull that out at the right time for you. That was in Provo. It was between uh, First East and Second East. Uh, first East and uh, no, First West and Second West and Second North and First North. That whole block. Now let's see. Okay. He was the first president of the board of trustees of the Brigham Academy. You said. Uh, and responsible largely for building the academy building uh, between 1884 and 1892. This is a picture of the old academy building uh, in uh, 1900. He said at the time to his wife, Annie, I have a piece of property that is not mortgaged. I have had to do it to keep the academy going. His legacy of unwavering faith and work in the restored church during his 60 years of membership, his role as loving husband and father to a very large family, his distinguished service as mayor, as first president of the BIA Board of Trustees, as president of the Utah State, while being successful businessman in the development of over six Provo businesses, and his donating most of his accumulated wealth to these causes, his uh, inspirational. This is him not so long before his death in 1895. He passed away in 1895 at age 80 and was buried by his four wives uh, uh, in uh, the Provo City Cemetery. Joseph uh, F. Smith, one of the presidents of the church, as you know, said at his funeral service, when the roll of honor is read of the names of those who made this academy what it is today, Second only to Brigham Young will stand the name and fame of Abraham Owen Smoot. And I say happy 200th birthday, Grandpa. Mm -hmm. Now I have just a few concluding comments. See, I'm still in good time. Can't believe it. <laughs> See which one I want to mention. Well, I have appreciated the opportunity to come and be here. You know, I spent lots of years here, 45 or 50 or whatever it was, a good part of my life and it's fun to be back. Uh, I have loved this uh, uh, choice of profession. Chemical engineer has been just perfect for me. It's allowed me to travel worldwide at their expense and to consult <laughs> and to see and, and to have really exciting jobs, uh, you know, to do fun things on and think about. Uh, I, I made the right choice for me. I hope you did for you. Uh, I don't plan to retire I think ever in my life, I may be forced to. I haven't said, but you should know, uh, among other things, my wife had a surgery, a brain surgery, four years ago tomorrow. And uh, she's left uh, partly disabled. She can't walk alone or with the cane, but with the walker, short distances, or with the wheelchair when I push and stuff like that. But we're doing very well. It turns out, uh, I am the primary caregiver, and if you can believe that, I mean, I, I do all the shopping, all the check writing, all the dinner preparation, I mean, that's staggering to me, yeah. But we eat out a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so we're doing very well. In fact, the statement we use, so you'll know if it comes to you in your lives, together we are independent. I hope I can keep her that way, that's my goal. Don't know if I can, but right now we go, go to ball games, football, basketball, we go to plays and concerts, we travel uh, on airlines and go to church, and so we're quite active. But it is something that uh, takes a lot of my time. I still have enough time to work some. My schedule, so you know, is I go in at 7 to combustion resources, work till about noon, uh, then go work out every day, except Sunday. Uh, I tried that and it was locked. <laughs> uh, then I go home, start in on stuff I have to do at home. All the mail, all the check writing, 
Uh, I don't have to do all the house cleaning. We had daughters that come and help on stuff like that. Uh, food preparation, I do all the shopping. Well, that's just the nature of a full life. And uh, then I did finish on us, and this was after she had had that stroke. It's my wife, so you can see her. We published this book a couple years ago. In fact, it's titled Our Joyful Time on Earth. Then the subtitle is The First 80 Years. Mm -hmm. See, I'm already a year behind. I'm 81 now. So uh, anyway, this tells the whole story. We, we put it in for our family. We give them all a copy and put it in libraries and stuff like that, too. Uh, my life has been rich. It continues to be that. I love my time here. It's a privilege for me to come and spend this time with each of you. Thank you.